all. Welcome back to the Imagine Cements lecture series. Today I am going to discuss about one of the most important skills that defines an emergency situation is the airway management. Assessment and management of airway is a prime most importance when it comes to emergency situations. So in the current lecture, I'm going to teach you about basic airway management and usage of supraglottic airway devices. In a separate lecture, I'll be dealing with endotracheal intubation. I'm Dr. S. Prakash Babu, Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Karpagivanag Institute of Medical Sciences and Research. So getting on to the lecture, hypoxia is one of the most common causes of pre-hospital morbidity and mortality. Neurologic damage occurs within minutes of onset of hypoxia. Usually within five to eight minutes, the neurological damage in the brain starts. Basic airway management protects commonly against reduced oxygenation in the pre-hospital setup. It can not prevent against aspiration. Airway management starts with assessment of the airway. Before going into managing an airway, you should know the basics of airway, the basic anatomy of the airway. Airway is nothing but the passage that connects between the external environment to the lungs and conducts air from the external environment into the lungs. It can be divided into an upper airway and lower airway. When we are talking about management of an airway in the primary survey, we are basically concentrating on the upper airway. Upper airway consists of the nose, nasopharynx, mouth, oropharynx, hypopharynx, and the larynx. So this is a picture to show how the airway is formed. Air can enter either through the mouth, through the nostrils, or through the mouth or the nostrils. The air entering through the nostrils gets humidified and reaches the through the nasopharynx, reaches the hypopharynx. Same thing happens for the air entering through the mouth. It reaches the base of the tongue and leads into the hypopharynx. Then from hypopharynx, the air is led into the trachea and food is led into the esophagus. So when one is eating, he cannot be breathing because the epiglottis closes against the glottis opening, preventing any food getting aspirated into the windpipe normal. The larynx, part of the larynx form the upper airway and part of the larynx below the true vocal cords forms the lower airway. Coming to the functions of the airway, mainly it acts as a conduit for transport of respiratory gases. It can also participate in blocking particles from the air because of mucus and the nasal hair can block large contaminant particles. The lymphatic tissue surrounding the airway acts as an immune filter and attacks any bacteria initially attacking the airway. Air is also humidified before reaching the lungs so the dry air is not reaching the lungs which can drain the surfactant. So first you need to know about what causes an airway obstruction or black air. The different causes at different places mainly causes the pharynx, larynx and the subglottic region. Pharynx, it's usually due to maxillofacial trauma or soft tissue swelling including the epiglottis. Liquids like patients' own secretions, blood or vomit can lead to blockade in the pharynx. Most common cause of airway blockade is the falling back of tongue in unconscious patients. The posterior part of the tongue just slides back and blocks the pharyngeal inlet so that it blocks the airway. Larynx, one of the common causes is foreign body. Edema, like an allergic reaction, inflammation or trauma or burns. There can be laryngeal edema which can block the small glottic opening. Laryngospasm, which is a severe contraction of the larynx can lead to glottic open closure and laryngeal trauma can lead to airway obstruction. The subglottic area mainly it's foreign bodies or sometimes it can be 
bacterial tracheitis which are swelling within the mucous membrane of the trachea and can block the vent pipe. Coming to the assessment of the airway, how you are going to know whether the airway is patent, maintainable or not patent. Basically, these are the things when you need to see when you are looking at an airway in the primary survey. If the patient is awake, alert and he is speaking in normal voice, he is having a patent airway. So, airway and breathing problems have been effectively excluded in a patient who is in upright position, alert and is talking normally. An unconscious patient requires rapid airway assessment and appropriate management. An obstructed airway can cause a result in death of the patient immediately. Assessment includes three steps. In step one, you are actually looking for any evidence of airway obstruction at the time of examination. Obstruction can be either complete or partial. In a complete obstruction, there is silent chest without any chest rays or minimal seesaw chest movements can be seen. In a partial obstruction, wherein the trachea is obstructed or the airway is obstructed partially, there is small opening going through. The air becomes laminar flow which can create a sound called strider. It can be due to airway swelling, compression of the hematoma, or mainly the epiglottitis, inflammation of the epiglottis can lead to strider. Secretions like saliva and blood can partially block the airway. Snoring because of relaxation of the tongue muscles and falling back of the tongue can lead to partial airway obstruction. Smash, when a patient has been smashed on the face, a risk of loose teeth and blood in the airway is a cause of partial obstruction. In step two, you are looking whether there is risk of anticipated airway obstruction. As of now, airway is not obstructed, but based on the clinical signs and symptoms and the disease progression, you can anticipate an airway obstruction at a later course. Like if the patient is having a carbonaceous sputum, which is a thick sputum and singeing due to burns, they can lead to risk of delayed airway swelling from intubation, inhalation and burns. A stab or swelling on the neck, risk of delayed airway compression from expanding hematoma or the neck moss. In step 3, you are looking, is there a risk of aspiration from failure to protect their airway in patients who are so sleepy or have reduced GCS due to either hypoxia, hypovolemia or any influence of drugs. So basically these three steps will you will be assessing in ba for basic management of the airway. Then you should know what are the factors that help you in predicting a difficult airway. You can remember this easily with the mnemonic how not. H transfer history of any previous airway difficulties which is one of the most clinching point in predicting a difficult airway. The patient has been attempted intubation earlier and failed and that has been documented you have a document this most clinching point that tells you that this airway is going to be a difficult airway. Anatomical abnormalities of the face, mouth and teeth like a receding mandible, holding the scope will be difficult, a large trunk, there will not be enough space for you to meddle around in the mouth, buck teeth wherein the teeth are loose or high arched palate where your scope cannot reach the vocal cords. Visual cues like in patients like obesity, excessive facial hair like a bird aged greater than 55 years indicate a difficult hair. Restricted neck, neck mobility, or arthritis of the neck joints, or short bull neck, neck immobility, opening of the mouth is less than three fingers and trauma, maxillofacial injury, burns or bleeding into the airway are the predicting factors for a difficult airway. So what causes difficulties during your airway management? 
there can be difficulties when you attempt to bag mass ventilate the patient there can be difficulties when you try to do a direct laryngoscopy difficulties in supraglottic airway placement difficulties in placement of an endotracheal tube and difficult surgical airway these are all the difficulties and let's look into how you are going to predict this difficult areas. so difficult mask ventilation can be predicted by the mnemonic mons where m stands for difficult mask seal like in patient with beard or facial trauma or facial dysmorphism wherein you are you cannot get a tight seal when you place a face mask over the patient's face similarly obesity an obstetric patient or a patient with an obstructed airway due to angioedema or abscess you will not be able to push enough generate enough pressure for the air to move inside advanced age it's always a difficult airway patient without teeth edentulous patients the mask will not stay in place and it will not fit into the the facial architecture patients who are snorers are having stiff lungs like in severe asthma or pulmonary edema where excessive force is needed to ventilate these patients then you need to evaluate difficult direct laryngoscopy by using the mnemonic lemon in this you are basically looking externally for any signs of difficult intubation by gestalt like facial dysmorphisms you need to evaluate a, something called as 3 3 2 rule and malampati scale if possible if the patient time allows and patient is able to sit you can assess malampati scale but most of the emergency patients malampati scale cannot be assessed because the patient will not be able to sit in an upright position obstruction or obesity and neck mobility so what is this 3 3 rule the first three stands for mouth opening it indicates access to airway and ability to obtain a glottic view mouth opening should be minimum of three finger beds but you have to measure that distance the patient's own fingers so the second three the distance between tip of mentum to the high head bone it detects the ability to deflect tongue with a laryngoscope the two stands for thyromental distance which is the distance between the thyroid cartilage to the base of the neck it predicts the location of larynx to the base of the tongue and how well you can visualize when you do a direct laryngoscopy then if the patient is able to sit you will make the patient sit and you sit opposite to the patient at a distance of 1 meter and you ask the patient to open the mouth wide and put his tongue out if you are able to see the ola completely until the tip of the ola scale is 1 is a easiest area if you can see only the base of the ola the score is 2 if you cannot see ula completely but you can see the facial pillars the grade is 3 if you cannot see even the facial pillars the grade is 4 and it makes the airway the most difficult then you need to assess for any difficulties in supraglottic airway by mnemonic rods r stands for restricted mouth opening less than 4 to 5 cm or three fingers of opening obstruction at the larynx or below a distorted airway which affects the seal for example trauma or abscess stiff lungs like severe asthma pulmonary edema stiff c spine with reduced movement fixed flexion of the neck or in rta patients where you don't have you should not move the c spine predicts a difficult supraglottic airway placement next you need to assess whether there are any difficulties for doing a surgical airway usually the most common surgical airway that is done by an emergency physician is the cricothyroidotomy which is the simplest and easiest procedure look for any previous surgery over the neck any scars over the neck and short neck any hematoma on the neck which distorts the anatomy obese patient when there you cannot palpate the landmarks 
a previous radiotherapy which has caused fibrosis and distorted landmarks trauma to the larynx or any tumors of the larynx can predict difficult cricothyroid indications for airway man management include basically three types step one is failure to oxygenate if the patient is having persistent hypoxia despite maximal oxygen supplementation ventilatory failure which is not reversible by the clinical means failure to protect airway like in low gcs oropharyngeal secretion or bleeding and maxillofacial trauma next anticipated clinical course based on the disease status you can anticipate whether is going to be a need for airway management in such cases you will have to manage the airway early before it becomes difficult and becomes urgent to manage the airway so in patients with moderate to high likelihood of predictable airway deterioration need to facilitate evaluation and management in isolated patients patients who need elective intubation in case of sudden overdose multiple traumatic injuries especially maxillofacial trauma and penetrating neck trauma wherein a hematoma can develop at a later time and it can cause problems with later airway management or any evidence of vascular or direct airway injury in patients with active resuscitation pain control need for invasive procedures and imaging outside of emergency department better to intubate and shift the patients and if you are predicting an inevitable operative management in a patient who will definitely need intubation at a later time in the ot it's bet always better to intubate the patient in the emergency department and directly shift to ot coming to the basic airway management the first thing is patient positioning conscious patients obviously will maintain the airway themselves and they can may go into an optimum position to maintain their airway and drain the secretions and blood uptended unconscious patients should be turned into a recovery position how are you going to handle the secretions the correct patient positioning with postural drainage wide bore suction catheters like anku connected to a powered suction unit or preferred handheld suction devices should be used as a backup suctioning should be performed under direct vision and no blind suctioning should be done it should not be more than 15 seconds at any given time because of danger of causing damage to the mucous membranes and increasing the airway inflammation flexible suction catheters may be inserted through oral or nasal airways to provide ongoing airway tolerance next most important thing that need to be managed immediately is a foreign body airway although less frequent it can happen especially in restaurants where patients are eating after having a binge drinking there can be an partial airway obstruction because of the foreign body or there can be a complete airway obstruction in case of partial airway obstruction the patient will be coughing cyanosis inhale to breathe or weak respiratory movements strider and gurgling noise can be seen and patient can have sometimes this universal position of choking wherein the patient bends forward opens the mouth and puts his two hands against the neck which indicates that he is choking complete obstruction cough will be weak or the patient may not be able to cough he is not at all speaking universal choking sign inability to maintain posture collapse cyanosis cardio respiratory arrest will ensue so how are you going to manage foreign body airway in adults you need to assess the severity if the obstruction is mild there is partial airway obstruction the patient is able to cough encourage the patient to cough continue to check for deterioration to ineffective cough or until the obstruction is relieved the obstruction is severe that is patient is not coughing effectively the patient is conscious you need to give five back blows or five abdominal thrusts or you can if the patient is maintaining the posture you can use hemlich maneuver if the patient becomes unconscious 
need to start CPR and follow the DCL, DLS or BCLS guidelines. So this is the Hamlich manual. You need to go behind the patient, put a leg in between the patient's hands and support, slightly bend the patient forward, put a fist in the subsified region or the epigastric region and give a forcible thrust upwards and backwards. So this is the position of thrust. What happens when you give a thrust like that? You are basically increasing the airway pressure which can push out a foreign body. There is no limitation on how many thrusts can you give until the foreign body is expelled or the patient becomes unconscious, you can go on giving the abdominal thrust. So you have decided that patient needs an airway management, you need to follow an algorithm approach. If you are a basic provider with basic training, chin lift and jaw thrust can be performed based on whether the patient is a traumatic patient or non-traumatic patient, oropharyngeal, nasopharyngeal airway can be placed and provide supplemental oxygen. If this is insufficient, start ventilation with bag mask ventilation. If that is sufficient, put the patient in lateral position or the recovery position. If necessary, start bag mask ventilation. You have an intermediate level of training. You perform these maneuvers which are insufficient, start bag mask ventilation, consider a supraglottic airway device. Supraglottic airway device is successful, verify the correct position by visually looking the position of the cuff, auscultation and if possible use a cap. You are an advanced provider with ability to intubate the patient. Your basic airway management maneuvers become insufficient. The next step you need to go for is ET intubation. If endotracheal intubation is successful, you need to verify the position and you continue ventilating the patient. If endotracheal intubation has failed, we will call it as a failed airway. When an experienced provider attempts three times and is not able to secure the airway, that is called a failed airway. You need to reassess the situation. You have to go back to 30 second drills, bag mask ventilation plus adjuncts like SAD and prepare for cricothyroid. These are the airway maneuvers I was talking about. This is a neutral position. Look at the airway. It's not open. It looks blocked. And the tongue has fallen back, posterior part of the tongue has slid in and it's blocking the posterior pharyngeal wall. So you need to decide whether this patient had a possibility of trauma or he is a medical patient. If he is a medical patient, you will use a maneuver called head tilt and chin lift. You place a hand on the forehead, turn the head backwards, place your fingers under the chin and lift the chin. This causes the airway to become straight and opens up the airway. When you lift the chin, the tongue fall back and is lifted off the posterior pharyngeal wall and the passage becomes open. If the patient is a traumatic patient, you need to do something called as jaw thrust manual. Basically, you are, here you are elevating the tongue off the posterior pharyngeal wall. You stand at the back of the patient hook your fingers around the angle of the mandible, lift up the jaw and then push the chin with your thumbs downwards. That will cause elevation of the tongue from the posterior pharyngeal wall and opens the ear. If the patient needs continued management in the pre-hospital where you are an intermediate or a basic provider you can use airway adjuncts mainly oropharyngeal airway oropharyngeal airway is made up of a rigid plastic 
It is designed to hold the tongue forward and preventing sliding back and obstructing the airway. Correct size is selected by measuring the distance from the corner of the mouth to the tragus of the ear. It is suitable for unconscious patients who doesn't have a gag reflex. Remember, oropharyngeal airway can induce a gag reflex. So, you know, to be very, very careful to check whether the patient is having a gag reflex or not before inserting an oropharyngeal airway. If the patient is having gag reflex and you have inserted a oropharyngeal airway that can induce gag, the patient can vomit, which can be aspirated, leading to more difficulties with the airway. OPI insertion should be followed by endotracheal intubation. Definitely, if the patient is able to tolerate an OPA, that indicates need for definitive airway management. So, this is one of the models of oropharyngeal airway, which is called a Gedels airway. It has tapered edges to reduce oropharyngeal mucosal trauma on insertion. It has a body latex-free, biologically inert polymer body, and reinforced bite block, you, color-coded range of sizes, and flange to limit the depth of insertion, rigid kink resistant curve to push the tongue forward, keeping the epiglottis off the posterior pharyngeal wall. Coming to the sizing, you can either measure the size and place the oropharyngeal airway, or you can choose based on this table. A size triple zero is used for neonates, double zero for infants, zero for small child, one for children, two for a small adult, three for medium adult, and four for large adult. Three, which is green in size, most common airway used in adults. Basic airway agents, nasopharyngeal airway, made up of flexible silicone material. It can be used in patients with intact gag reflux who cannot maintain their airway. After lubrication, it should be inserted through one of the nostrils along the floor of the nasal cavity, preferably through the right nostril and into the upper airway until stopped by the flange. Appropriate airway length is equal to the distance between nostril and the angle of the jaw. Next is supraglottic airway devices. They are devices placed in oropharynx allowing oxygenation and ventilation. They are a bridge to the endotracheal intubation. Rescue devices after unsuccessful intubation efforts are not suitable for prolonged ventilation. In the out-of-hospital setting, these devices have shown to improve survival after a cardiac arrest. After insertion, position has to be confirmed by ETCO2 and they have large cuffs which can induce gag reflex and should be used carefully. Next is bag, mask, bag wall mask ventilation. It contains a self-inflating device coupled with a face mask here and a wall, expiratory wall, peep wall, self-inflating bag, air inlet one-way wall and O2 reservoir socket, air inlet and pressure release walls with there and you can use a reservoir bag to increase the percentage of oxygen that you supply. So, bag wash ventilation systems can deliver approximately 70% of oxygen with optimal use. Although they can be used in the room air, if a reservoir bag is used, this percentage of oxygen supplied can be increased to up to 84%. Bag mask wall ventilation can be done using one or two percent technique. This is a one percent technique where you make a E and a C. With the C, you hold the mask and press it down against the face. With the E that you have made with your three other fingers, you put against the angle of the mandible and pull the body of the mandible behind so that you maintain the air position. Whenever using a two-handed technique or more than one rescue is available to maintain the airway, you can use something called as E squared C squared technique. And it gives some proper fit and more easily you can ventilate the patient. This picture shows a modified approach wherein it becomes difficult to obtain a proper mask seal. You can use this approach. 
and continue with the supraventricular glottic airway devices. Some of the pictures of supraglottic airway diseases. First is the eye gel. Picture B shows the King LT laryngeal tube. This is the laryngeal mask airway. And then you have Shilly esophageal tracheal airway. So the eye gel has a soft gel like cuff that seals the fairy laryngeal structures. And you don't have to inflate when you insert an eye gel. Lubricate the device and advance it to the posterior pharynx until a resistance is met. Lips should align with the lip line and the eye gel. Complications are infrequent and include throat pain and laryngospasm. It is available in various sizes. And coming to the king laryngeal tube, it is a single lumen tube with proximal cuff that seals the posterior oropharynx while a distal cuff occludes the esophagus. The king LT is placed blindly into the oropharynx until lip aligns with the device lip line. Balloon is inflated to a pressure of 60 centimeters of water. 90% of the time, tube remains in the esophagus and allows ventilation through multiple proximal fenestrations. This is also available in various sizes depending on the patient height. If the patient is somewhere between 4 to 5 feet, you use the size 3. 5 to 6 feet, size 4. Greater than 6 feet, size 5 can be used. Then laryngeal mask airway is the most common device used nowadays. It can be placed blindly through the mouth and it occludes structures around the larynx. You need to inflate the cuff with 20 to 30 ml of air. And various models are available with provisions to suction and there can be an intubating port which is an intubating LMA. Complications include aspiration and possible airway obstruction. Usually used when vocal cords are visualized during intubation to facilitate blind intubation. Sorry, when vocal cords are not visualized during intubation, it can be used to facilitate blind intubation. So types of LMA. LMA classic is the first generation LMA which is made up of silicone. Original design. Low OSP and increase their cost with processing. LMA unique is also a first generation LMA which is made up of polyvinyl chloride. It is a disposable form of classical LMA. LMA fast track made up of polyvinyl chloride and silicon combined. It can be used as an intubating LMA to guide blind and difficult intubations. It is bulky, no pediatric sizes are available and the increased cost of processing and the disadvantages. LMA flexible, made up of polyvinyl chloride and silicon. Wire reinforced tubing, head and neck procedures, it can be used. LMA Pro Seal, and LMA Supreme or second generation LMS. Procyl is made with silicon and Supreme is made with polyvinyl chloride, which is disposable. Sizing of LMA size 1 is used for neonate or infants less than 5 kg. Size 1.5 is used for patients 5 to 10 kg. Size 2 for infants and children 10 to 20 kg. 2.5 for children. 20 to 30 kgs, 3 for children and small adults, 30 to 50 kgs, and 4 for adults who are 50 to 70 kgs, and 5 for large adults who are more than 70 kgs. Shilly esophageal tracheal airway is a plastic double lumen tube that is inserted blindly. It has proximal low pressure cuff that seals the pharyngeal area and a distal cuff that seals the esophagus. Inflate with proximal balloon 80 ml of air and distal balloon with 10 ml of air. The next type of LMA is a Cobra PLA which is similar to King LT. Advantage is that ET can be inserted through the lumen of the Cobra PLA. Converting an SGA to endotracheal intubation is very very important because if you remove the SGA and you try to intubate, there can be problems with oxygenation and intubation may fail. So the first type of conversion is a removal of supraglottic airway device and performing a direct laryngoscopy to intubate. When no airway difficulties are predicted, you can go for this method. You can also convert an SGA like King LT or IGEL with a gum elastic boogie. Pass gum elastic boogie through the lumen and then over that you can guide your endotracheal tube. 
convert SGA with a fiber optic bronchoscope. You can pass the fiber optic bronchoscope into the trachea through the lumen of one of these devices and take out the device and thread your work in a tracheal tube over the fiber optic bronchoscope. Leave the SGA in place and perform a surgical airway when you predict this is going to be a difficult airway and you will not be able to intubate the patient. So this is about basic airway management. If you have any doubts, you can inbox me. Thank you.